Thank you. So uh, let me thank you first of all for being uh, here with me today. And um, it is very important in two aspects, this talk that I will have today. Uh, firstly, because it's my first talk overseas. So uh, I'm glad to have uh, a new, let's say, uh, uh, audience of the, the, the things that uh, I am talking about. And it is also my uh, great pleasure because this is the first talk of this uh, Jean Monnet chair program that EU is supporting on teaching and research on EU studies. So I hope uh, uh, we will enjoy, uh, I will try to give some of my major arguments and to have you uh, let know for some of the uh, major issues that going around the uh, region that I will talk about, the Western Balkans or the so-called Southeast Europe, and then perhaps we can have a, a friendly talk on any issues that you may have uh, interest. So the, my, my talk today will concentrate mostly on the countries from the Western Balkans, and uh, my main arguments will be to see a little bit of what has been achieved so far in this region and what are the motives for the region joining the European Union. And uh, let, we will see a little bit also if we can have, let's say, a date or a perspective for this region uh, going into the European Union. So whenever I used to, to or when we in, in Europe uh, used to talk about the region, it is very problematic on how you call it. Uh, firstly, because this has to do with the connotations sometimes that the region has taken. And usually the Balkans, when we talk about the Balkans, it doesn't have a good connotation. So mostly people prefer to call it South, Southeast Europe. But I'm still using the term Western Balkans uh, since I'm dealing with uh, EU integration and that's the term uh, that, they, uh, that they are using. So pretty much when uh, we try to identify what this region is about, it's this easy formula, you know, like ex-Yugoslavia ex excluding Slovenia, which enter into the European Union, and plus Albania. So if we will see from the progress made so far by these countries, we see huge differences among the region, although they are like neighboring countries. And we have the best case, which is Croatia, over here, that last year they did manage to become a European member country. And then we have four other countries which are on the way towards uh, European integration, and today they are candidate country, with Albania getting the status on 2004, very recently. And then we have Macedonia that uh, got the status on 2005, and I will talk for the reason and, and why Macedonia is doing uh, not well in, this, uh, in regards to EU integration. Montenegro got the Candidate, uh, candidacy status on 2010, and lastly also Serbia had this uh, chance of becoming a candidate sta uh, state. And then we have two other, two more states which have their own specificities and problem, uh, problems, and that's regard Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Kosovo, which pretty much the problem regards uh, state issues, and they haven't been yet candidate countries. So that's pretty much the region when uh, I will concentrate my speech today. So let me give a very short uh, summary of the transformation that has happened in this region after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Differently from what has happened with Central Eastern European countries, this region suffered a lot from violent conflicts. 
So after the 90s, the major issue of those countries was not, let's say, democratization, like uh, building a democracy or a market economy. But the region suffered a lot from the violence and the disintegration of, of the whole region. In 91, we have uh, what, what, what it is called also like the 10-day war with the separation of Slovenia from the ex-Yugoslavia. And then I think uh, other countries follow to have this pat pattern of disintegration, but very violently. And the uh, war in, in, in uh, uh, Bosnia, which engaged both also Croatia and Serbia, lasted for many years. And I think still Bosnia, although it's a country today and there is no conflict, it is suffering from issues of how to build a state. And then we have again a disorder in Albania, which the, the, the conflict there was not of an ethnic base, but still we have a fall of a state in 97. And then to go uh, on with the issues of uh, stateness on this region, we have also the conflict in Kosovo and also in 2001, the conflict that, uh, the ethnic conflict that happened in, the, in, the, in Macedonia. So then, if we talk for transition to democracy of those countries, that came very late compared to what has happened to the rest of the Central uh, East Europe. And that's like breaking out of the legacies of communism type and state market economy. That has been the challenges after 2001. But I think the most important event of those times, of 2000, it was the, it was the perspective that the region got to enter into the European Union. So till that period, the region was seen as a neighboring country of Europe, you know, but uh, without a perspective. So that's where we will uh, stay most and try to see like what those countries need to do for joining sooner the EU, uh, the EU project and following also the best example of uh, Croatia. So then we'll see uh, what are the motivations for EU to get those countries in and also what are the motivations of those countries to to join the European Union. I have tried to figure out the, the arguments in a kind of logic, trying to see what may be the, the motivations, like in economical term, or like uh, as a nor normative values, and also the, the biggest issue that is discussed in this uh, region, which regards security. So when we talk for normative claims, uh, Usually it is thought that the reunification of Europe, that the, the major issue where Europe wants to have those countries in. So that project was initiated in the 90s, but still it's an unfinished job if the, all the Western Balkans countries will join the Union. So then uh, the idea of Europe, it's unified in diversity. And I think getting the countries of the Western Balkans will be a good example of this philosophy that Europe is, is having. And that, that will be also a, a good model for uh, worldwide, seeing that, yes, democracies can function also when you have different uh, religions or also when you have uh, very different groups of ethnicity. So I think in this term it's a strong normative claim that Europe could do worldwide if they have uh, the Western Balkans in. 
And the third argument regards uh, Europe's credibility of being, you know, a soft power all around Europe. Oh, sorry, all, the, all the, around uh, the world. And that has been like the major issue when uh, EU is taking some peace missions in the world. So if Europe could not solve its own problem, then what will be, you know, its credentials if they are going abroad to serve for peace? So if we talk in terms of economy, uh, usually they are not the strongest one for having the region in, and that's like some of the arguments regard the increase of, of market, like Europe will have a greater uh, market and, uh, for, for their trade. Usually the region, there are some calculations that say like uh, two-thirds of all the trade from the region is done with European uh, Union or the countries inside that. But still, in very absolute term, when, when we see uh, what is the total share of that uh, amount of trade, that's very small. Like this uh, trade going on with the region, it's only 1% of the all trade that Europe is doing with other countries, including US. But the major argument when, when we talk for, uh, in terms of economy, it's that non-enlarging to the Western Balkans is more costly than having those countries in. And what I mean is that in, like if we consider the intervention that uh, Europe did on the, uh, on the countries of the Western Balkans during the, ten, uh, the first 10 year period of uh, transition, we see that there has been spent like 8.3 million, billion, sorry, dollars on the region. And that help has come in terms of financial aid, you know, so it is for purposes of consumption and not investment. So in this case, it will be more convenient for EU to have those countries and invest for having them doing some reforms rather than trying to intervene at times of crisis. So I think that's the strongest argument if we talk for economical incentives of why enlarging EU. But then as I was saying, the major arguments regards uh, security and peace in the region. So the, the idea that this region got out of the very violence and conflict will be the main argument to keep in mind. And I mean, if we see what is happening around Europe, in the, sorry, in the neighborhood, then like the case with, uh, with Ukraine. So every time the, the argument is brought that we don't have to forget that Europe brought peace in this region, so it's better we keep the peace going on rather than having again, you know, types of conflicts around Europe. So I think reducing what I call negative externalities of non-enlarging is a good argument for having the countries of the Western Balkans in. And also it's very strategic for Europe because its initial idea was bringing peace to Europe. So bringing peace also to the Western Balkans and having them in, it's one of the fundamentals of why Europe or why we have Europe today. Then what, what are some of the arguments for the Western Balkans, why they want to join EU? After 90s, so uh, after the fall of communism, I remember when they have been 
the protest the, the, of, the, uh, of the Albanians, you know, uh, at the road, the, their uh, slogan was that we want Albania as Europe. So for most of those countries, the idea or the European values has been their dream. And that, that for whatever all problems that has happened in the region still, there is the perception and feeling that the region shares European values and norms at the end. And another argument regarding normative sits that if those countries will join the European Union, they will have uh, credentials or political advantages for going around Europe. So it's like uh, as you have passed a test from a nice university. So that's also a good argument for those countries to be. And I, I mean, in, in many terms, they will profit from being part of the EU. The example is there, and like the countries that have joined NATO, you know, are thought to be the countries that are stabilized, so they could get more investments on the country. So there is a domino effect uh, if countries will join the European Union. And again, the main, sorry. So in terms of economy, I think that the region will gain more than, than Europe will do. And that is because they will have access to the EU budget they will have also access to the European funds that are going for pro-accession. Uh, and usually the, those funds help the, uh, the country to take structural uh, reforms. So the reforms that need a lot of cost. On that side, it, it, it will be very advantageous for the countries to be part of EU and have overcome the cost of doing some very tough reforms. There are a lot of programs going in, in Europe, like twinning, TIEX, Erasmus, so uh, if, uh, if the countries are part of it, they could try and have some gains if they, are, uh, if they join those, uh, those programs. Like, the calculation is that um, the financial aid that EU is giving to, to those countries it makes something like 0.7% uh, of GDP. That's on average because usually this, uh, this figure uh, depends, like for Kosovo it may be higher and for other countries it may be uh, smaller. And then the best arguments is why those countries need to join the EU, it's peace in the region. And the, exam, the example of uh, ex-Yugoslavia have shown that. And I think also political stability, and that's the case of Albania, where political parties have been fighting and the uh, EU has been, in, in a way, a kind of ne neutralizer. And going again back to the idea of the conflict in the region, with the new initiatives that EU is taking, it is putting in, 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 a, in a way to have those countries cooperate among each other. I think that has been one of the major challenges of the region, where you have like uh, also educational programs set, like Albanians with other Western European countries, and the same like Macedonian University doing with other European countries, but none of the exchange come among the countries. And that's also in terms of economic cooperation. So I think regional cooperation will be uh, good initiatives and also free movement of those people in the region will be also a good initiatives for the, 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 the countries to get out of the, their past. 
And at the end, like joining, uh, if you remember the map, you know, like now all the countries of the Western Balkans could be considered as an island, you know, surrounded by member states. And that sometimes creates also psychological issues, you know, like you feel isolated. And uh, I could give the example of what Kaliningrad is now, you know, surrounded by other uh, states, and it feels like very separated from the uh, home motherland. So I think all these problems will be overcome once the countries of the Western Balkans are in. So they will not be anymore like, uh, let alone, isolated. So which arguments uh, that we talk about we need to see? Usually Europe is taking the example of what has happened with the Central Europe and what has been the lesson learned so far. Uh, in the beginning it was thought that joining, uh, taking the countries of the Central Eastern Europe into the European Union will be a burden and a problem for EU in economical terms. But I think all the reports the latest one shows that those countries have done well and sometimes better also than the EU member states alone. And there has been some good examples like the GDP per capita of the Czech Republic, Slovenia, Slovakia. It's at 70, 75, 80% of the EU average. You know, Slovakia also had done a huge progress regarding economy because 10 years ago Slovakia was a aid recipient and now it's a donor, like an aid donor to, to other countries. I think in, in the period of 10 years it, it has shown that progress can be achieved through being also a member of the EU. We have also like negative cases, so not everything is white, you know, something in, in the gray zone. And in this respect, every time the case of Romania and Bulgaria is brought, as some countries that haven't done well, especially regarding justice and anti-corruption, and I think that was the case where EU changed its own policy, and now all the countries will start from that point, like arranging justice and fighting corruption on those countries. Hungary also is, is another case which is showing that instead of doing progress in terms of democracy, it has done some regress, you know, with the party that is in power now holding uh, and controlling like uh, judiciary and also media. So, there has been also some, uh, let's say, bad remarks, but I think you, EU should not uh, leave the idea of expanding further, but instead trying to get lessons from these cases and try to see and figure it out how it should deal with all the countries. So if we talk just for uh, why it is good to have those countries. I think we haven't managed to, to figure it out that, okay, then when those countries will, will, uh, will become member states. Because otherwise they could have some kind of cooperation, you know, for the issues that are profitable for both parts, but having them not member states. So what EU has done, it's it is asking from the Western Balkans country to fulfill a number of criteria. And the most fundamental one that they have been used also for Central Eastern Europe regard uh, having a stable democracy, rule of law, and respect for human rights and minorities, having also a functional market economy, and also the capacity to uh, cope with the market forces in the, in the EU, because it's a union, a free union. Also, 
there has been claims for having some administrative and institutional base on those countries. Because when we talk for the obligations of membership, once a country becomes a candidate and it needs to start the negotiations, the number of policies and law that they need to adopt, it's very huge. Uh, usually, we don't count by, like there has been, there are 35 chapters, so that's the way, or sectors, how EU has, uh, uh, is dealing with its own policies, but usually because the policies that has been adapted in EU are changing, usually we, we call it by number of pages. So, till now, as you can see, like the countries of the Western Balkans need to do a hard job on adapting all these legislations. And uh, although it is called uh, the negotiations process, you have nothing to negotiate on those. Uh, so the only thing that you can do is ask some time of postponement of when you will apply a certain policy or a certain uh, law. So I think there is a huge, uh, let's say, demand from those countries if they have really the administrative capacity of not just uh, adopting those policies but also implementing them. And like as I said, after like the enlargement to Central Eastern Europe has been also an experiment, but an experiment that has given lesson to what it should be done in the region. So then uh, other conditions were added to the region that the region need to comply. And one of them is compliance with international obligations. So the countries uh, as Bosnia need to fulfill the criteria of so the Dayton Agreement or uh, the other countries that were engaged in war need to comply with international tribunal regarding uh, Yugoslavia. And also another issue that Europe has uh, added to those countries is they want for sure that the countries cooperate among each other. And also there is this idea of good neighborhood and the countries before entering the Union, they should, by force in a way, or they are obliged to resolve any issues that they may have among themselves. And that was the case of the dispute between Slovenia and Croatia. So Croatia was not progressing unless they resolved the issue. The same is happening with uh, Macedonia and Greece. Macedonia cannot progress unless it resolved the issue of its name with Greece, which is a candidate country. But then I think beside the formal you know, criteria, there has been also some contextual, that we may call criteria, depending on the situation, the, the today's situation in EU. And if before it was pretty much the commission, you know, the executive part of the EU that was taking the, pro, uh, the, the process forward, today we need to have also member states consent. And here including also public, uh, uh, public opinion should be in favor of those countries joining. So I think that the situation is also more difficult for the Western Balkans. And that is because also EU is a moving target, you know, so. EU is a process, is, is a project in itself. So unless you get it when it is nearer, then if EU is moving fa faster than you, then it may be much more difficult to get there. And uh, I think today they talk also about, of, about uh, absorption capacity and that you can find also in many 
of the official documents. So, meaning that Europe is in doubt and it says, okay, we need first to integrate this, what they call the, the Big Bang, like the 10 countries entering into the EU. So it's an internal problem. And then they will look after the enlargement. So how to, how to overcome those difficulties? Uh, if we see on the, on the, what has happened on the process of enlargement, the progress has been done when a member state that is pro-enlargement has had its presidency. And that is like the 99 when the German had the presidency that the Western Balkans got their perspective. And then later on, like on 2003, we had this so-called Western Balkan summit in Thessaloniki where the process also got some, uh, some push forward. And I think yesterday, this year, there was this discussion that the, Greek, the Greece has the presidency, Italy has it now, and all the discussion was that the momentum for enlargement was lost, and that's sometimes understandable if we know the problems that the Greece and Italy is facing. So I think they, their agenda was not so much in favor of EU. But I was happy to hear that yesterday, uh, under the German, again, leadership, there has been a summit in, Ber uh, in Berlin regarding what, uh, what we need to do for, for the Western Balkans. And I think that's a good signal, you know, showing that although Europe is in its own crisis, you know, although there has been difficulties and engagements uh, with regards to the crisis in U Ukraine, that's a good signal saying that, okay, we haven't forgotten the, what is the idea of unifying Europe, of having the Western Balkans in. But still, as I said, with the process going on, the public opinion of the member state and also of the countries wanting to join will matter. And here there are some uh, graphs that regards uh, what has been the public attitude uh, like on average for all the countries of the Western Balkans regarding enlargements. And usually that varies a lot depending on the, on the countries. But two major uh, issues can be seen that this percentage is very low, so like people from, uh, from the countries of the EU are very reluctant to enlargement now. And uh, furthermore, this, oops, sorry. furthermore, th there has been decline, like on, on the way how and the, the, the wish that those countries has, have to have more countries in. But still, Croatia did it well, like even beside the, the very, let's say, skeptical and negative uh, perceptions from the uh, European citizens, Croatia did it. And I think Croatia was also facing the other opposite, where they have, where they have their uh, skepticism inside the country. So from this graph, if you see, Croatia is the only the country that has the lowest uh, wish of joining the European Union. But let me go again to another graph, which I think is very important because when we talk for uh, public perceptions in the European Union, enlargement is thought to be, uh, you know, the, uh, the problem of not mostly economic, but also of cultural issue. And I mean, this graph, uh, that, that's a summary of the uh, Eurobarometers that are done in Europe in 2009, and people were asked 
what the countries need to do before joining EU. And I think they are mostly in line with the EU criteria. So a country to join EU need to be a democracy and a functional market. But I think there are also other issues that perhaps may matter, which is like culture and religious. And I think Turkey is showing that the progress perhaps may have some step back because of this kind of uh, like perceptions and how they influence political decisions. Uh, just uh, a few things regarding now the perception of the people from the Western Balkans and if they want to join EU or not. I think the bad, like well, the, the highest percentage of acceptance regards states like uh, uh, Albania and Kosovo and then the rest of the countries I think are more skeptical with Serbia being also the, the skeptic country. I think it may have some reason because of the intervention that happens to, to Serbia and also like uh, in Bosnia and I think that could be seen by the citizens, you know, as an intervention of Europe, so why we want to enter in. And I think the period is short of the conflict, so it may take some time to, to overcome this kind of conception. But still I would say that when people are asked if they would vote in, in a potential referen referendum for uh, the country to join the EU, most of them are pro. So even in Serbia, when I said that there is a lot of skepticism, there is the majority that would vote yes for the country to enter into the European Union. And sometimes the polls have shown that the citizens of those countries trust more EU institutions than their national institutions. So just some uh, uh, remarks of what can be done in this case. First, Europe is helping, you know, or offering the, the so-called reformist forces in those countries, you know, it, and that's one way of how to overcome the, the problems of stacking or the so-called the waiting room, like you don't know if you will enter one day or uh, perhaps you abandon the, the idea at all. Uh, sometimes when we have seen like that the countries where uh, European identity or perception is higher, it is much more easy also for the politicians to justify the reforms that they need to take in, in expense of uh, some of the biggest issues that they may have like um, education or health. So they, they are pro to take some reforms on uh, what EU is asking rather than uh, trying to, to tackle their own uh, hottest issue. Until now, like the problem so far is that EU Commission has been the only promoter of the idea of enlargement. And we have seen that the interference of the member states having a say and a good say in the, in the enlargement problems may have been the, the, the huge obstacle. I remember here the case of Albania, which for three years and something was applying for the member, uh, for being a candidate country. And although Commission was giving a, a positive opinion, like the process was stopped because of uh, like some countries saying a no to, to Albania. So I think that's where also the process rests. It's not only the European institutions, you know, but also member states, politics matters. Um, also another point here, because usually it is discussed, and it was this fear of the last European elections that the 
nationalism and uh, euroscepticism going on a high. And I mean, the latest European election has, has shown that, like, that the parties that are against Europe has gained uh, uh, an increase. But I think the rest of the country, uh, like the biggest parties in, in Europe, that is the socialist and also the PP party, the uh, populist uh, party, they, they are pro, uh, pro EU enlargement. So I think that's also a good sign. But still there is way to go for those countries uh, joining the Union. So when we talk for a date, it's very difficult to, to have a, a clear perspective of how the process will go and when the, the, those countries will become candidate countries. But I think, like, on the best case, let's say that uh, uh, Montenegro, for example, because uh, it started its uh, negotiation process on 2012, and if we take what has happened with other countries, like in Croatia, where the negotiation process lasted for six, six years, and also they were waiting you know, to be uh, monitored that all the things that were settled would have been implemented, so it's like, uh, eight-year process after the negotiation. So for Montenegro, the best case will be 2020. But I think that's very optimistic because what we need to consider is also like if EU would be ready and how far EU has moved. There are some mechanisms that EU is using. And the first and the most important is what they call uh, conditionality, meaning that uh, Europe, it is not forcing, but it is offering something in, in exchange of the reforms that they will do. And the best that Europe can offer is EU membership, but that should be credible. And I think the case of Croatia entering the Union shows that the process hasn't stopped. So if countries are doing well in terms of adopting its policies, then at a certain a period of time, they will join the European Union. Persuasion. Europe has been also one of the idea and the value of this region. So I think most of the political parties and also the, the citizens, they are convinced that European values and uh, democracy, like European democracy, that's the best choice. So I think that's also another argument uh, going in favor, although that's problematic when we have rise of nationalism in, in those countries. Socialization, that has been also an, uh, another mechanism. So Europe is financing a number of programs to have people from all over Europe exchange. They, they, they do that in academia. They do that also in the public administration and the, the, the so-called twinning program when an expert of a specific uh, sector could go and work in another country of Europe for one year. And I mean, that's the idea that to mingle Europeans and also learn by doing. So it's not it's something voluntarily where you can get some ideas and also reduce the prejudices that you may have for, for other countries. But I think only the, the mechanisms that Europe is, is using, it's not enough, so it should come also by the, by the countries themselves. So there should be a political will by those countries to, to take the reforms. And I think also it should be the capacity, administrative capacity and also financial capacity 
on handling the cost of those uh, uh, very costly reforms. Uh, what, what Europe has achieved so far? I think the best example it is that Europe is empowering certain actors, such as civil society, for example. Civil society has found a way how to influence policy through European Commission. So when, when uh, the Commission is doing its progress report, the yearly progress report, uh, it asks a number of, of actors beside their like institutional and member state, it asks also civil society to have a say. So that has been also a way of empowering certain actors in the region of how to influence in domestic politics. Another argument that sometimes goes against regards the share of power, like is integration against democracy? Because what has happened on, by the example of those countries that are in, it shows that the executive or the power of the executive is much more than of that, of that parliament because everything goes for uh, integration. So the uh, prime minister could claim that everything is done in terms of EU asking them. So sometimes there is all this discussion of uh, where the share of power goes with the influence of, of the integration process. And also there, there has been uh, impact on the EU side because uh, a growing EU then requires to recalculate the share of the um, peoples that will be in the parliament or who will be and what will be the power of vote in the council. And usually the calculations shows that a greater EU with 33 uh, member states will be difficult you know, to have a consensual uh, decision taking rather than uh, when, when it is like of 28 as, as it is now. So in terms of democracy, what has been achieved so far? I think from 90s till 2000, the, uh, most of the indicators shows that the countries of the Western Balkans has not been democracy. And I think from 2000 and onwards, at least we can see that the region has done some progress with uh, what they can be called as semi-consolidated democracy, and that's the case of, of Serbia and Croatia. And then we have something as a hybrid, so, which means most progress in terms of democracy is needed. But still, something that we can see from, the f from those figures is that for a period of uh, more than 10 years, there has been a stagnation and not progressing further to make those countries a consolidated democracy. So what may be the, 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 the challenges of, of this uh, for those countries? First of all, it's that those countries have a very weak, or can be called weak states, where their institutions do not function well. There have been problems of corruption, clientelism, you know, and also polarization among the political parties. In terms of economy, I think they, the countries are doing well uh, with regard to their GDP growth. But still those countries are dependent on, on the foreign aid. So that's also an issue to, to be taken into consideration. And mostly they are not considered functioning uh, market economy, and I think that's because it relates also to how the, the state is functioning, so it regards to the political issues. Then in terms of taking or adopting EU policies, 
even here the, the differences are very wide, usually Croatia seems to have done it well and that's why it's a member state while for the rest of the countries I, I think they rest only on some progress in terms of adapting and implementing policies. Do we have success stories? I think yes. Croatia is the best example that a country that has been engaged in war, like although it took some years still, they made it and they are part of, of, of EU. Montenegro also has, uh, has been doing well after the, the separation with, with Serbia and I think till now they have opened 20, 23 chapters. Macedonia in 2001 with the offer of, uh, of EU to open stabilization and association agreements that war of three months, like the ethnic conflict between the ethnic Albanians and Macedonians there was over. Although now we see to have other problems there, but I think at that time the tensions or the, the, the war was escape. The best example, Serbia and Kosovo. Nobody could have thought, you know, that those two countries will sit together. And I think it's under EU initiative that at least those countries have sat in a table and they have a dialogue. And these days, the, the Prime Minister, because in, in, in Serbia they, there have been elections, each of the party of Milosevic. So I think that's something also like showing that EU can do. And then again we have like all the settlement of the internal political problems in, in Albania. Do we have things still to go and failure in the process? I think yes. Implementation with regard to, Macedon to Montenegro may be a challenge for the future. As I said, the dispute between Macedonia and Greece, which has stopped Monte uh, Macedonia for in, in her uh, way t towards EU integration. Albania need to face with issues of corruption and crime in the country. Uh, other countries such as Kosovo and Bosnia need to face the problem of statehood. Bosnia is still administered like internationally and Kosovo has not been recognized by five uh, member, EU member states. Then can we say for EU to have had a transformative power in the region? I think compared to what we have seen in Central Europe, we can say that in this region it has been less, and I think it's contextual because it depends on the countries also. But I think there has been some major achievements, which means reducing nationalism and, and ethnic conflict in this region, that should be recognized. Violent conflicts also, like a region that has been in peace for more than uh, 15 years now. And also the fear that has been before for having some authoritarian systems. Now we can see that we don't have, let's say consolidated or very consolidated democracies, but at least we don't have uh, authoritarianism uh, in, this, uh, in this region. What, what we need to do then, then it's going further with the reforms and also what EU hasn't missed in this point is uh, the gap between, like uh, narrowing the gap between states and, and citizens on, that, on these countries. I think that where the argument may stay. So to make some concluding remark, I would say that there are differences among the Western Balkans on the way how they have handled with EU integration. And uh, like being one of the member states, it doesn't depend if you are 
today a, a full democracy or a market economy, which means that uh, how EU is doing itself matters a lot. So it's a, I usually like to call it a tango, which means that it, it needs to be played by both parties, not just one. And there has been issues that needs to bring this process forward. And it is like going from political will, you know, to take some, uh, some uh, reforms. You, you, you need to have the capacities to do that, administrative or financially. And also like exchange among the European countries and, West, and Western Balkans, that's also uh, something that helps the process. We compare every time with the Central Eastern Europe that they did it fast, and when we talk for the Western Balkans, we see that the process is going very slowly and it will, have, it will take much more time. But still, we don't have, like, we, we have to recognize that there has been progress, although we may not be satisfied, but if we consider the, the, the problems that the region has, I think it has been good progress. And uh, why, why en entering the EU? And why we, we need this EU? I think beside all the economical issues or political issues that it may bring or it may have a cost, I think we don't have to forget the, uh, the initial idea that Europe was built about. And that's like peace and security for the region. So I think I may, I may uh, end here my, my speech and just saying that to consider both unifying Europe is the aspiration of the Western Balkan countries, but I think it should be also the obligation of the European Union to do that. So thank you and I think I'm open for discussion. Thank you. We have, we have time for just a couple of questions, if anyone has a question. Yes, ma'am, right over here. First, I'd like to say thank you for coming. Thank it you. is indeed an eye opener, just to understand exactly the location. Um, but given um, that they was once under the Ottoman Empire control from the 1500 to 1912, um, there was monarch control from 1914 to 1925. They was also under another monarchy control from 1925 to 28 to 1939. They was conquered by the fascist Italians, or Italy. And they had social unrest and collapsed anywhere between 1990 to 92. And they had a large uh, migrant of people leaving that country in the late 90s that was Germans and Italians and Greeks and Switzerland and they all came here to North America. One of the things I'm, I'm going to ask you whether or not we should even care because our country has already given them 280 million dollars in aid considering the drop in the bucket that the UE or the EU excuse me was only 0.7 it is a very poor country, you all, Albania. And given that they was under the Ottoman Empire for almost 400 years, sure, you have to have identity crisis of who you are today. So the question is that I want to ask you, why should I care? Given what we're facing here in the United States, given that we are also a very generous country, we are. Ma'am, if you could go ahead and ask your question. Million gotta... dollars is a lot of money, so, so why should we care if they become a part of the EU? The EU. Why should we care? Okay. Thank you. Question. Thank you. So we collect or we go? Okay. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. So why why should we care? I think alliances and. Uh, like what, what has been shown going around the world, it's like what happens at your next door, for sure it will influence you. 
So, I mean, that's one of the, <coughs> sorry, like the rationalist thinking. You know, that's like we are seeing, I think here, like uh, what happens to uh, 11, 11, like 9th of September 2001, like Europe was facing this kind of uh, terrorist attack from the within. But I think U.S. that what what uh, U.S. was experiencing, you know, was something from outside, which means that whatever it's it's happening in our next doors will for sure influence us. And then I think that there is also something no normative, like if we believe and we share on the same values, so that should be also like mutually and reciprocal. So I don't know if. Right here. Right here. Raise your hand, please, so she can, yeah. The idea of sharing cultural um, benefits with other countries, um, Europe has always assumed that it has a great deal to share, but would you say something about what the Balkans can share then with the rest of Europe culturally? So, uh, what, what the Balkans can share with, with, uh, with Europe identity? Well, that's a good question, but I think that uh, if Europe is trying to, to settle with this motto that it is unified in, in diversity, you know, something of the diversity that you can find, it's in, in, in the... Uh, Western Balkans, where you have religions of all kinds, where you have ethnicities very different. And sometimes the region has shown that they have survived as, as, uh, as entities. Or, for example, Albania may be a best case of how, uh, like, Muslims and Christians and other religions can... Uh, can be together without having a problem. So I think there may be also cases that the region will share, but usually when, uh, when it, we talk for the, uh, for like EU and Western Balkans, it is that the, this region wants to see, uh, you know, and to reach the, the, the project or the idea of Europe because as I said in the beginning, when, when we talk for the region, the region has gotten some very negative connotations, which people do not want to relate anymore to, to themselves as Balkans, but mostly as Southeast Europe. So I think it's also a, a, a shift on, on the ideas of getting rid of what has been uh, overloaded this region, like conflicts, and going to some more as uh, values of peace and living together. So I think that's why sometimes we use that the region is going towards EU and not looking back of what the region may contribute. We have time for one more question. She's coming wait, she's coming with the microphone, please. Wait for the microphone, please, sir. How did one region switch from being an aid country to a donor country and improve its status? the case of Slovakia, right? Uh, before, like, if we considered all the regions, Slovakia from the Visegrad group, like the po Poland and Czech and uh, uh, Hungary, has been uh, one of the poorest country. And after the country entered the European Union, there are... Uh, special funds, you know, for, that goes in m many of the policies area that, that EU it has. For example, one of them is the cohesion funds, meaning that most of the funds, like for that kind of policy, will go to regions that are the most poorest. So, Slo uh, Slovakia was gaining from a number of funds. Uh, structural funds also were, were uh, going to the region, you know, like building roads and becoming. So I think all of that and uh, like the free movement of capital, you know, made that 
the country should progress in their growth. And I mean, okay, like they are a donor, it's, uh, I don't know exactly the, the, the amount that they are giving or to which countries that they contribute. But as far as I know, like they are uh, helping Montenegro, so they have like uh, their amount of contribution may be small, but still it's, you know, something is a changing uh, attitude. So I think they are uh, helping small countries like Macedo, uh, like Montenegro on the on the way out. But I think it's one of the rewards of being uh, inside the EU. So once you have the will to to get some reforms, you have all this kind of uh, of support. And I think that could be also a question of how Germany did it after the war. You know, so with with a kind of well managed program, you know then progress can come, I think, may be a case. Well, let's uh, give uh, Dr. Yano a round of applause. <laughs>